The title is very broad. I could put the kitchen sink at the end of it. Uh, but I wanted to give you guys a little overview of some of the things that I've been working on and some of the more sexy stuff, like the, uh, the moose and the bear work. So in Alaska, um, I did my work in the summertime. I would uh, head up there every summer right after my final exam. And unfortunately, I wasn't in one of the most attractive locations in Alaska, but it's hard to find one that's kind of unattractive there. Uh, but I was in the south central area, interior, uh, game management unit 19D. It's in the town of Merab, the village of Merab, on the Cuscoquim River drainage, which you can see right here. A lot of confluences, large river basin, um, and really neat place to do work. And Alaska Department of Fish and Game were my collaborators. Uh, they had been doing a research project out here trying to determine why the moose density is so low. A uh, very important topic for them to understand, really know the nuts and bolts of what's causing that, uh, because it's important for their subsistence lifestyle out there. So the small villages surrounding the graph, quite a few of them, uh, no roads in, no roads out. So you're basically driving around in ATVs and some beat up cl uh, clunkers. But you need to hunt to survive. So you need to have a healthy moose population out there. There's about 140 moose that were needed. About 80 were being uh, harvested during that time. So where's the discrepancy? Uh, this could be part of it. Alaska Department of Fish and Game around that same time predicted there were about five packs of wolves, 150 black bear, and 40 brown bear in the area. And so here are the major players that I want to introduce you to. In the lowland area of McGrath, there's only one major large herbivore, and that's the moose. There are no caribou here. So you can imagine with multiple predators, they're going to be pretty choosy about the quality and timing and, and space use of that resource. So we've got our black bear, which typically prey on the young moose calves or those that are diseased, sick, and old. And we've got our black bear, which will tend to go for the young as well as the adult. and then our gray wolf, which do the same thing as the, um, black, the brown bear, uh, choosing both adults and juvenile um, of those animals. There's also some inter-gill predation in here as well. So in terms of methodology, for the three summers that I went out, again, working closely with Fish and Game, they had collared about 50 adult moose, uh, cow moose. Um, and because this is an area that has really dense stands of alder, and also willow and whatnot along the river, they typically will, will give yield to at least twins um, in this area. So these, these cow moose are going to give uh, quite a few moose caps onto the landscape during that period. So basically, we would follow those collared, 50 collared animals right around the time that they're predicted to give birth, and we would go out with a helicopter and collar the moose calves. And then throughout the summer, we would then investigate any kind of moose calf mortality and take a look at who might have killed that particular animal. So in 2001, that's what we did. In 2002, we did the same thing, but additionally, we had uh, about 20 GPS collars that we deployed on black bear in that area. There was enough kind of information that we had gathered from moose calf mortalities in a couple years prior that suggested that bear were the ones that we should be focusing on in terms of keeping that moose calf density pretty low. So we put those collars on the black bear, again, followed the moose calf mortality during that period of time, and then my final year, went back out a little bit early this time, right before calving, caught as many bears as we possibly could. Most of them, well, many of them were my collared bear to get the collars back, look at the data. Uh, but we relocated many of those bear northward many, many kilometers to a point unknown to me, and relocated them to give the moose calves a chance to make it through the winter that next year. So in terms of what we did on a daily basis, I basically would program in the VHF collar frequencies into um, this receiver. We would hook it up to a plane, this Piper Super Cub, and there's on the wing struts, you, you find, you can't really see it here with the lighting, but you would find the antenna. And so we get high enough so we could hear the signals. Quicker pulse rate on the frequency if it was a dead calf. We'd then fly over, get a location, come back with our awesome uh, R22 helicopter, and get as close as we could, land, and then hike into the mortality site. I know, tough life, huh? 
Um, so at that point, we would take the antenna off of the side of the helicopter and we would radio track in to a moose calf mortality site. And some of the things that I'd be looking for would be the carcass disposition. So how does it look? Um, are we basically finding a couple of bone fragments? Are we not seeing anything, not even the collar? Are we seeing hoof caps and a lot of the skin? A lot of that would determine which species we were looking at um, as the predator. Also, uh, I would be collecting any sort of hair that would be on the surrounding plants. So typically rose, which is common out there, a lot of brambles. So you'd be able to capture a lot of the hair from some of those potential predators. And we'd go out within a day. So in terms of having another scavenger in there, chances were pretty unlikely. And oftentimes the predator was on site, so I was in there and done quick and went back in the helicopter pretty, pretty uh, fast. And some scat as well, so again, signs of cooling pits, any sort of sign um, that would help indicate where the predator was. Now in terms of the capture of the uh, bear for the GPS collars, we would do that from the helicopter using helidarium techniques. And uh, then we would land and take some metrics on the animal while we were putting the collars on. Basically looking at condition, we'd be drawing blood for disease, we'd be weighing the animal to kind of get a feel, how are they doing in terms of consumption. We would be looking to pull a tooth, usually a back premolar, um, so that we could age the animal, also look at tooth wear. We'd be measuring things like skull, um, cranial measurements, as well as foot length, that sort of thing, putting collars on, and ear tags, colored ear tags, um, and ear flags, actually, so that when you're flying ahead, uh, overhead, you're seeing orange in one side, it's like a flap of kind of vinyl, and uh, green in the other side, you can get a feel for what that animal was. Uh, and then tattooing, finally, in case we lose those ear tags that have numbers, we have a numerical tattoo in green on their inside lip. And so we were interested to use this GPS data to determine whether or not these bear were honing in on moose calves during that time when they were born. Um, and so we wanted to look at a few things, location being one, also timing of kill. And we predicted that there would probably be a difference in the timing of the kill and most likely a difference in where these animals were killing moose calves. And um, Oswald Schmitz came up with a nice term, I like it a lot, it's called habitat domain. And basically he wants us to consider not necessarily predators grouped together as one guild, but very similarly. He wanted us to kind of tease it apart and think about how these predators are killing. So for example, with black bear, how do they kill? You guys know anything about how bears kill? They stalk, yeah. So they'll be hiding, sit and wait predators. They'll, they'll take their time and then they'll stalk um, at a fairly close range, being stealthy. Whereas the wolf is a coursing predator. It's gonna be chasing the prey off great distances. So perhaps there's some sort of a correlation there in, in their behavior and, and how they're managing the play. So in terms of timing, we used Crespo Wallace tests um, to get sort of a, a general feel for are these predators killing at different times? And this is these are data from 2001 and 2002. 2003 I had to leave abruptly uh, for personal reasons, but just wanted to let you guys know, frequency of, of moose calf mortality according to the day of year. You guys have heard of Julian Day? Most likely as wildlife ecologists, many of you. Um, so day since January 1, that would be Julian Day 1. So what we're looking at here is the timing of gray wolves, both years, brown bear and black bear. And in terms of when they're killing, what we found was that both bears seem to be killing around the same time. But the wolves are killing later on into the summer. One of these animals will probably be more knowledgeable, faster, and more adept at outrunning. And when we looked closer at space use from all those mortalities that we walked in on, a lot of the black bears were killing in mixed deciduous forests, really pretty areas actually. Um, brown bear were killing again in mixed deciduous forests, but also along riparian stringers, um, old oxbows, a lot of uh, iracaceous shrubs. And then gray wolves in needle leaf forest, also on forested islands, which is kind of interesting. So again, just showing you the differences here. Uh, we're looking at a bunch of different habitat types, areas where we have no data. I mean, it's hard to get in remote locations, nice um, 
uh, land use clearinghouse kind of thing. Um, so we were lucky to have some information from Ducks Unlimited, uh, but we were limited with uh, how much coverage area we had. And what you'll notice is with the bears, they're a little bit more, um, they have more of a broad habitat scope. Again, a lot of preference, I'd say, for that um, mixed forest. But you're definitely seeing those wolves preferring that needle in the forest. So again, we're seeing that separation between coursing and stalking predators. Now let's look closer at the GPS collar data and let's break it down according to date, even within that same day, where are they moving? Again, predictions, if we're losing so many moose and we're losing them to bear, are they honing in? So we kind of predicted that uh, during this window when moose calves were born, it's a very short window, uh, we predicted that the bear would be moving in, so they'd leave their dens and then we'd be moving in towards it. Because when we get out there, there's still snow on the ground. So you find a lot of the moose in lowland areas around swampy muskeg where there's a lot of vegetation like horsetail still available to them. So in terms of looking at cumulative moose calves that were born, again, versus Julian Day, for all three years, very predictable. Moose calves are typically born around May 20th when we're all hovering down in the library studying, right? And then duration of calving about a week and a half. So really quick pulse of moose on that landscape. And if we were to break down movements of some of the animals, again, I tried to focus in an area where we had a lot of moose calves, so near the calving ground, so I didn't use all 20 animals, these are just six. But I've named them non-resident and resident, meaning where are the den sites? Are they in this calving area or the outside of the calving area? So the non-residents were actually females and a young male. Um, and they moved in from sort of leaving dens, bless you, down towards, that yellow represents timing of parturition, towards the calving area and were in the calving area right, right around the same time. And then those that lived sort of within that, or den within that area, had a couple of sallies, exploratory sallies outside prior to calving. But then they zoom back in and we're in the vicinity of calves during that period of time. So some interesting movement patterns and some sex-specific movement patterns too. So how does this get into management? Um, you guys know the rationale, the impetus for the study. Um, and there was something more on that, that final year that was done. With all the data collected, again, focusing on bear, knowing bear were the majority that were killing. Uh, we handled, we went out there again earlier, before calves were born, handled 95 bear. So many of the black bear were heliodarty, most of the grizzlies were um, the leg hole snares and whatnot that they used out in Alaska. And of the 95, here's the breakdown, 88 bears, again, relocated northward uh, to different areas prior to calving to give those animals, those moose calves, a chance to make it. So here's just kind of giving you an idea. The, the falls following uh, our work, 26 to 33 percent of calves were surviving. That's pretty slim pickers, right? So in terms of recruitment, we probably won't be seeing many of them make it through the winter, because what happens in the winter time with these predators? Bears are going to hibernate. Wolves are going to be out there. So in fact, the, this idea that we were relocating all these bears could have backfired, right? What might have happened? Bear are gone, and then bear hibernate. Wolves could get voracious, right? They could just amp up their consumption rate, and they could basically negate all the efforts that we had. Uh, but fortunately, what we saw, an increase, 64% of those calves alive in September. Um, so, you know, things were looking good. This is actually a hyperlink. I'm not going to go to it right now. But if you guys were interested in it, there is sort of a management report following to give you more information about it. So it was an effective adaptive management plan. Now, this is where I'm transitioning. So you can imagine that now moving on to these small liberal arts colleges, it's going to be a little tricky financially and also in terms of safety to get students involved, right? Very flashy, very fun stuff I was doing. But how are we going to equate this bring it back down to the level of a smaller institution. Well, I really was interested in the multiple predator, one prey or pulse prey kind of system. And if you think about small mammals, there's quite a few within that guild. And we do have this pulsed prey resource. That would be our nesting trees. 
So certainly, I think small mammal research is ideal in a lot of life setting. It can answer a lot of interesting questions, disease, and, uh, predator management, that sort of thing. Um, rationale for the investigation with beach bark disease. So I was at, I guess I was at Colgate University at the time. So I was situated between the Catskills and the Adirondack Park, and thinking about what sort of research projects I might do. And I got to doing some reading, um, some work by those from the Institute for Ecosystem Studies on beach bark disease, and I thought, hmm, seems like a good spot to be in to do research at both of these sites. Now, knowing that uh, beech trees are a very important masting tree, important fall food resource for those mammals, I was curious what this disease that's pretty much in the aftermath phase in all of our forests was doing to the diversity of small mammals in various areas. Um, through the regions where I expected I'd be doing some research. Uh, there's a lot of other habitat ecosystem in implications as a result of that. If you lose beech trees, you guys know anything about the beech leaf? You felt it, right? How does it feel in the fall compared to like a maple leaf? Anybody? Easier to tear? A little thicker? It's harder. To, to tear, it's a little thicker in a sense that it's got a lot of uh, lignin and whatnot in it, a lot harder to break down. So if you were to lose major beech trees and what might regenerate might be red maple, it's going to change the composition in the soil, the breakdown, the leaf litter, duff, that sort of thing, and affect the invertebrates that are on the ground, which ultimately might affect shrews, right, other insectivores and other birds and whatnot that are down there. So there's a lot of implications for nutrient cycling, so a lot of reasons to look into this. So I know Dr. Evans has done a lot of work with beech bark disease, and you guys are probably familiar with it. But just as a reminder, up here we've got a range from 2005. Um, the green is the range of the beech tree. The pink represents, I believe, the nectria fungus, and the red represents the cryptococcus scale insect. So it's kind of a dual action punch here, this complex system that results in beech bark disease. But again, um, very important tree for many mammals as well as bird species and changing our uh, woods as we know it. So the nasty end here, the advancing front, the cryptococcus scale, if you guys go out and look at the nice smooth beech trees and see all the white flakiness on there, that's the cryptococcus scale, leaving little holes, puncture marks that the nectaria fungus can then inhabit during the what they call the keeling front wave. That nectaria fungus is going to be in there doing its work uh, and basically cankering the tree and leaving behind a forest that's got split trunks and damaged canopy, um, a lot of beech thickets growing below, um, some stumps sprouting, but it's going to not look as beautiful as it once did. Now, the beech seed itself, very important again, as I mentioned, to these small mammals. It is like a little mini Snickers bar that we get at Halloween that we don't want to share with anybody. Um, it's got lots of um, good stuff in it, low phenolics, right? So they're going to be easily digested as well as low ash. Um, a lot of nitrogen, a lot of fat, again, very good food. So if it's so good, how is it actually making it out the woods? Any thoughts? What's the strategy? That seed morsel is so delish. How is it made? Yeah, swamping, satiation, doing exactly what our friends, the moose, did, right? So that's one way this tree is able to make it. So it's important that we understand what's going on with those seed predators. As I mentioned, there's a lot of vertebrate seed predators. We've kind of mentioned the small mammals, but also bear. You can find bear kind of up in the branches eating those, those seeds. We've also got an invertebrate. There's a beach uh, moth that likes to uh, attack those delicious morsels as well. So important to understand what's going on with the predators. Okay, um, This is a study by Jensen that basically laid out a bunch of seeds um, to two different small mammals and watched which ones were taken first. Okay, So ideally this is their preference, right? And uh, for both species, uh, they really went after the beech and the, uh, the oak tree, the acorn, really quickly. So we know it's desired. So if it's desired, then how are we getting beech to regenerate at all? How is it making it there? You guys probably know from your forest recap classes that most of the seeds that fall from trees are going to fall where? Far away? 
it was right under, right? Right under the parent tree. So really important for a seed predator to be able to disperse that far away. And even more important, to be able to cache it in a really good spot, nice moisture, coverage, that sort of thing, and then be forgetful, right? If you're a beech tree, you don't want to be consumed by that small mammal that's just cached you in its burrow. You want to be able to make it. So um, they count on these seed predators to eat some of them, but also to uh, forget some of them. And so typically when we see beech regenerating, it's usually only in a mass here and in areas where we do have a healthy small mammal um, population and, and where we don't see a lot of those beech trees. So the sites, um, I did some work in the Catskills. Some of you guys might have been out here, Frost Valley, um, it's a YMCA. So really important when I'm doing research with students to have access to a cafeteria, access to bathrooms and dorms and stuff like that. So a lot of the sites were picked as a result of that. We've got the YMCA up here in the Catskills, um, up in Newcomb. You guys have probably been over to the Huntington Forest, another site there. Um, I work over near Minor Institute. In fact, I teach my wildlife class up there uh, near the outdoor of Flat Rock. Uh, we have dorms and whatnot up there, so we set up some traps, as well as in the Green Mountains, at Coolidge State Forest. So methodology, this was again work I did at Colgate University with numerous undergrads one summer. We went out and we set 100 traps in each of these sites and spent four nights at each site um, monitoring these traps. We also set up some seed traps, 20 big buckets, 5 gallon buckets, strung them from mature beech trees that we knew would be masting, they usually, usually mast as older trees, and measured the diameter at breast height and the state of disease so in a ranking of 1 to 5, which is given in the literature already, um, how diseased are they? We did that in the vicinity of that trap in all cardinal directions. And then we did some analysis. In 2007, I went out and scouted out two of these sites, the Adirondacks and the Catskill site, just to kind of get a feel what mammals and are we going to find. And what we found is a lot of uh, mice, paramyscus species, we found summer of 2007 in the Adirondacks. Also, that's, uh, we have our uh, redback bull as well. And then in the Catskill, same sort of trend. Lot of mice, redback bull. Now when I came out with the students the next year, I put an arrow here showing you where uh, the mice are. Okay. The mice that we typically saw. What are you guys seeing? A lot of mice? A lot of paramiscus? Not so much this year. This, I think, was the most fascinating thing about this whole study, is what we tended to find was a ton of jumping mice. Now, what is going on here? Um, and then we also saw quite a few shrews as well. Uh, in some areas, not so many animals at all, 16 only in the Catskills. That's four nights, you know, 400 trap nights of effort. Um, and so basically what, what we're seeing is a total transition in the species. We're losing paramyscus, which are always really common. You can always go out and catch mice. Uh, and picking up these cool jumping mice with the long tails. Why? Turns out they, are really, um, they really desire fungus. And so they, are very easy, they can easily switch between seeds and fungus. So that might have something to do with it. So if we broadly look at some uh, general analyses on uh, biodiversity, so the Shannon Index and evenness, that sort of thing, species richness, um, if we just focus on the 2008 stuff, uh, I basically made it easier for us to see. The least biodiverse site was in the Adirondacks. My feeling is that's most likely, and it might seem kind of weird, but I think it's most likely because the sites had a lot of beach uh, regrowth, a lot of thickets that might not have had a lot of seeds there. Um, and we might have seen uh, more shrews or some other species, but less biodiversity. And in the Champlain Valley, the most biodiverse site, I think it might have something to do with us being near the Flat Rock. Two very different habitats, mixed forests, versus this uh, totally different jack pine barren habitat. So maybe we're seeing a little bit uh, of migration in there. When we looked at the beach mask results, uh, we found some interesting stuff too. That first summer I went out and scouted out those two sites, I spent a lot of time putting those uh, buckets up to get rid of nothing. Um, so when I went back again, uh, it was a non-masked year, and so um, Stacey McNulty at SUNY ESF had really gotten nothing as well. 
And we predicted that there would probably be fewer mice that following year, which may have something to do with the trends that we're seeing. Uh, when we strung them in 2008, went back in the fall to see what we got, uh, quite a difference there in the number of seeds that we were capturing. So we probably would have predicted last summer to see more paramiscus again, those true seed predators as well. Uh, but we weren't uh, able to get back out there to do another set of sampling. So in summary for that research, basically we're going to need to look longer than a one to two year study. I think we need to capture more of the cycling. I would have been excited last summer to see did we lose those jumping mice and gain those uh, paramiscus. We did see that the Champlain Valley, which is very surprising to me, was the most biodiverse area for small mammals. Um, and this is sort of a conundrum. The Catskills seem to have the, the most intense level of disease manifested, at least in the sites that we looked at. But they also had the most mast that we were able to harvest. And, the, and uh, they had low animal um, levels there. So kind of strange. You know, Why are we seeing so few when there's such good food there? Um, not really sure about that. I have to dig a little bit further into the, uh, the literature. And then, again, we seem to see this two-year cycle of beach, beach mass, so really uh, cool stuff that we're seeing between the woodland jumping mice and the uh, paramiscus species. So that's the kind of research I, I did when I first got to uh, student Plattsburgh. And now I'm trying to transition to some other stuff and maybe some more local areas that I can get students working. Um, and so in my wildlife classes and my independent studies, we've been able to look into some molecular work. You guys probably know it's a little bit difficult in the winter time unless we're doing work with snowshoe bear, which is common for you guys around here, um, and other uh, tree squirrels and whatnot. A lot of the animals go into the hibernation. We don't see them again for a little bit. So I thought it'd be interesting to transition in the winter time to more molecular studies, get some students involved in that. And so I used the Ecolog listserv. You guys heard of that? Okay, jot that down. It's a good place to, to find jobs and master's programs and that kind of thing. Um, you can join the listserv, you can take yourself off the listserv, you can search archives, but there's some really cool posts. Um, but I basically gave a shout out to the ecology realm. I basically said, does anybody have any move no, no, no. mice carcasses? Um, and whoops. And if so, can you send them to me? And so what I did get was some uh, carcasses shipped from Massachusetts and from Pennsylvania from a friend in grad school. And uh, we had some uh, saliva that we collected from mice during our studies in New York. And my thought was, we kind of have a feel for paramiscus, deer mice and white-footed mice, uh, that at higher elevations and higher, the further north we go, we see more deer mice and fewer white-footed mice. Maybe it's a physiological thing. So our predictions were regionally we'd be losing white-footed mice the further north we went or further, further uh, north in elevation. Um, but my major question is, can we really trust identification in the field of animals that look so similar? You guys have been out and captured mice, deer mice and white-footed mice, they look really, really similar. And there's a couple of ways that um, the books suggest that you can identify them. Look at the tail coloration. If it's more blended between the white and the grayish brown, tends to be a white-footed mice. Um, and if it's sort of a, a distinct line, then it's going to be a deer mouse. Uh, look at the body length to tail ratio, that sort of thing. But they scrunch up. So it's really hard to, to figure out what it is in the field. So I said, how true are these field guys? Could we be getting it wrong all this time? Is it important for us to look molecularly as well? So by taking uh, the field IDs from the folks that capture the animals and comparing it to molecular work that I'm going to talk about shortly, we were able to see that it is really important to use the molecular work as well. So um, we had some students that were surveying some small mammals in uh, New York. Uh, specifically up in mixed forest and also on the Flat Rock. We got the uh, samples from Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. And here's just, in case you guys are wondering, how do I get saliva out of these mice? Um, we capture them in Sherman traps, which you're probably familiar with. We take a little capillary tube, so remember in chemistry, the tiny little straw that's made out of glass. So we'll give them a drink of water. 
once we've scrubbed them. And then you will draw out the water and the saliva as well, um, and then save that, freeze it, and then go to for our work. Uh, we also nick a little bit of the tail because I'm continuing to do some molecular research um, to do PCR and ultimately sequence that to determine what species it was. But an even easier technique, although it's a little harder to read on a gel, is a salivary amylase gel on acetate. Have any of you guys done this? No? Um, these sorts of protein gels are done in some molecular labs, um, but they're not as widely done in a wildlife lab. So basically, you buy these precast gels, you rehydrate them, they've got a little bit of a plasticky sheen on the back, and they're not, they're really flimsy. Um, you take your saliva, you put it in a little stamping uh, unit here, and you stamp it onto the gel. And then you hook that, and here's the stamper, it kind of shows you how, how we do it. You put it in a regular gel box for gel electrophoresis. You guys, how many of you guys have done a DNA gel run PCR and that kind of thing? Some of you? Okay. So basically, it's a little unit, a plastic unit that has an elevated portion in the middle and two wells on either side. You put your buffer in there. It's got some electrolytes in it. You plug it into power. And it basically runs your samples, whether it's DNA or if it's proteins. It'll run it down according to weight and charge. Now, these are saliva gels. It's a protein, an enzyme, right? What does saliva break down? You guys know? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, starch in particular. Okay. So the idea with this gel is you stamp it, you run it out for 20 minutes um, with charge, and then you make a mixture of starch, cold starch, and agarose, which is the jelly kind of gelatinous stuff, and you sit it on top of that outside of the gel box for about 20 minutes. You rinse it off, and then you counter stain it in iodine. That's why it kind of at the end looks kind of a orangey color. And depending on where you see the band, that's where that enzyme from the saliva has broken down the starch that was sitting on top of it. Okay? So the Paraviscus maniculatus, the deer mouse, has a little bit of a heavier um, molecule. Okay? It doesn't run as far in the gel. Whereas the leucobus, the white-footed mouse, I always think leucobus low, it runs lower on the gel. So that's a really easy way for you to determine if that's deer mice or white-footed mice. Okay? So what we found was there's a lot of discrepancy out there. Now, if you lived in Massachusetts and you were working with this researcher, you were right on the money. Everything you said it was in the field was exactly what it showed up on light on the gel. Um, if you were in Pennsylvania, you really should do molecular work. Or maybe you had too many observers out there in the fields giving their take on it. Um, the Little Shazy River Basin and Minor Experimental Forest, those are in New York. They're up in the Champlain Valley near where I work. And these are two different researchers that did it, so it could be an observer thing. But again, it gives reason to do these sorts of things. So if we were to, again, break it down, the white-footed mice is what we thought in the field, those Pennsylvania folks thought they were all white-footed mice. They were wrong. Most of them, I'm trying to see the color, most of them were white-footed mice. In Massachusetts, they were on the money. And in New York, in general, in a riparian area, um, what we thought happened to be mostly leucopus, white-footed, ended up being mostly deer mice. So, that's not where it gets exciting. This is where it gets exciting, or at least I thought it did until this summer when we did more research. Um, we, we looked at the animals that they trapped just on those pavement barrens, the sandstone pavement barrens. How many of you guys have been up there? The flat rocks and Gadway and stuff? Really weird habitat, right? Glaciers came in, a lot of pressure, um, not much on the ground except the, the bedrock, the sandstone pavement jack pine, ericaceous shrubs, mosses, like, and that sort of thing. Really hot. Oh, I had a class up there yesterday, it was sweltering. It's sweltering everywhere, but it was even worse. Um, and so what, what we saw was, in the field, students weren't really sure. They thought it was a mix of stuff. Some of them they couldn't even ID. They just left in this sort of unknown paramiscus. When we ran them out on a gel, all white-footed mice. Remember what we were saying about moving from south to north, that we would lose, we would lose the white-footed, gain more of the deer mice because they phys physiologically can handle more of the cold. Well, this is a really hot area, a little island of heat. 
So we thought, hmm, maybe there's something going on there. So this summer I tasked a couple of students, Kayla Frenier and Whitney Wilson, to spend four consecutive days each month at two sites, the Gadley Barren up in Moors, which is up by the Canadian border, and then the Altona Flat Rock, to trap um, about 50 animals uh, each during that period of time, collect saliva, and run them out on gels. Now, they've only run one gel, and it was their first gel, so we're going to rerun it. Um, but it looked like there were two sets of bands. So what I was hoping was going to just be mucopus looks like there might be both species. So I'm not sure if it's because the, the collection that we ran out before was from the fall, and we had migration in and out of different species, or if this is, you know, this is some ephemeral summer thing um, where we're getting both species. I'm not 100% sure, but as we run more of these gels out this fall, we should be able to tell a little bit. More recently, uh, what I'm doing is I'm looking at non-invasive techniques. I'm almost done. This is the last part. Um, you guys have probably done some of this stuff or read about some of this stuff. But basically, not trying to harm the animals, picking up scat and hair and running gels, trying to determine what species it is. Really good stuff for corridor work. Um, the Split Rock, Split Rock Wildway is near where I live. From Willsboro over to Jay, can we see if these these are carnivores, and carnivores are moving through corridor paths there. Um, these are track plates and hair snares uh, that students are going to be developing in my class and setting out. Um, actually, taxidermy, I've been ca gathering taxidermy, can't really see it here. We've got quite a collection pulling hair from the taxidermy, seeing if it's going to work. And more hair snares up in the upper right hand corner. So there's some really cool stuff that you can do if you guys have some of the equipment um, and you can work with some of the other molecular labs to get the equipment. I got a grant from my school internally and was able to get um, some funding to do this. So there are some really neat kits out there from Kyogen that will allow you to extract from scat and from hair, <coughs> tissue, nails, that sort of thing, DNA. Really easy spin column. You take your sample, you add some buffers to it, you spin it down in the micro centrifuge, you decant off the liquid, and then in the end, there's a filter at the top of your little tube that's collecting DNA. The final wash drops it all down to the bottom, and here you have your DNA isolated. So when you run that out of the gel, you should see bands representing that you had a positive DNA extraction. So this is from SCAT that I collected in all of my excuse me, my travels, moose, an unknown sample that someone gave me, mice, chipmunks, you can collect it from your traps when you're doing stuff. Um, and then this is from hair. Now I sent a student down to the taxidermy uh, bins and had them pull hair, but I don't know if they pulled follicles. So all of our taxidermy didn't have an extraction that, that ran through positively. Um, we're going to try it again. It, it could be, again, they didn't have follicle, but it also could be chemicals that these were preserved in. I don't know what it is because it's from like early 1900s. It could be nasty stuff inhibiting it. Um, but what we do see is on some of the, the other tissue samples from roadkill that I had frozen, we were able to extract some DNA. And so we went to the genes. Uh, we looked at the mitochondrial genome, the circular genome, and specifically looked at the cytochrome B region and the D-loop region, which is up in this, this area, okay? And you can also, if you don't have the animal sequenced, if you don't have it sequenced and, and listed on our database, um, we can do a PCR, amplify the DNA that we've just extracted using a 16S ribosomal RNA primer and sequence it. It costs a little bit of money, and we're gonna have to do that with the sample that we currently got working. Um, but if you can, just amplify the cytochrome B and D-loop region. You can do some cool stuff. And here's an example. Um, as I said, not all my samples worked, but the fissure worked. Um, and so we amplified the fissure with the cytochrome B uh, and D-loop uh, primer. It just knocked off and amplified that region that we were interested in. And we tried to get this working this summer. Uh, it wasn't working at first, and so we amped up the amount of magnesium in the reaction, finally got it to work, but it worked at all concentrations, so it doesn't really matter. And once you've got that PCR on the cytochrome B, 
um, you can take that product and you can basically cut it with other enzymes. And this is the really cool part of it. So restriction enzymes will cleave your DNA at certain sites. So you know the A's, the C's, the T's, and the G's. Well, depending on what restriction enzyme you get, these are the examples of them, they cut at different sequences, okay? So I can choose a series of them, cut my product, and run it out on a gel, and I'll see different bands, okay? And I'll talk more about that. This is a gel showing you a coyote and then three different cats, bobcat, lynx, and uh, mountain lion. You can just do your PCR and run the gel, and you can see the bands are different. Canids run lower, the cats run the same. That, that PCR itself will tell you we have a, a canid or we have a cat, okay? But if you really want to know what cat you've got, you've got to cut it with an enzyme. So they chose to cut with one enzyme, and those three cats show different banding patterns, okay? These two look the same, so they have to cut with another one. So they can determine the mountain lion's different, but they can't determine if these two are different, the lynx and the bobcat. So then they cut with another one to distinguish those two. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So if we were to do this with a dog, okay, this is the dog 16S RNA, okay, and we are going to cut it with these restriction enzymes. I go through the whole sequence and I highlight where I see the splicing unit, okay? And with the gray one, you'll notice it would cut here and it would cut here, okay? So that's the SAL3A restriction enzyme. So when I run that on a gel, after I've cut it, I'm gonna get one strand, two strands, and three strands. So I'll have three bands, all right? As opposed to some of the other ones that might have many bands, or maybe just one. So it allows you to see based on the length of your fragment, what species you've got. Um, and here we have examples with kit fox and, and uh, red fox, gray fox, and, and coyote. These first two are coyote and dog, okay? Notice they show up the same. The bands, when they're cut with alien one, shows up the same. So you're gonna cut it again. The hin F1 didn't help at all either. So we cut it with another one, now we see a difference. Now, you'll see there's two G's. The second one is scat, just like there's two K's. The second one is scat. So you can determine between gray fox and kit and red fox, but you can't determine between the kit and the red fox unless you cut it with some other digest enzyme. So you usually pick a three enzyme to work. So when we did this, on the Fisher, the PCR that we did, we ran it out on the gel, and we cut it with three enzymes, and we did see a banding pattern. Unfortunately, they haven't sequenced the fissure yet. So I don't know the lengths that it should be. Um, I'm not 100% sure. So what we have to do is run a 16S RNA PCR and send it off to get sequenced, and then we'll have a sequence. We can figure out the lengths that we should be seeing. Okay? But as we have more of our roadkill and more scat and that sort of thing with different animals, we should be able to determine what species we've got using these non-invasive techniques. And with that, you guys have seen my whole life story. Um, and I thank you for being such patient listeners. Glad to hear you. wasn't so good, that that was what was limiting those calves. Um, 
fish and game feels it's the predators. Everybody kind of has their own agenda, you guys know that. Um, but I, I haven't really looked into uh, the, the history of it, but fish and game has. So my kind of interest was helping with the, the uh, mortalities and then looking at the bear movement, doing sort of that fine scale analysis. And they were the ones that wrote up, wrote up a lot of the management stuff and looked historically at it. But I don't think hunting patterns have really changed all that often. I know what has changed is bounties on wolves over the years, um, allowing aerial hunting of wolves and that sort of thing. I know they don't typically hunt bear over there because um, it's a lot of Native Americans. Bear are very spiritual to them. Um, when they're skinned, they look very human, and I can attest to that. They actually do kind of look human when um, we've seen one of them skinned. So, and the meat is actually not really all that good. There's some so usually when they hunt, they hunt. So they don't typically go out and hunt to reduce the predators, even though they should. Let me just repeat. Please, please stay seated. We will be out in time for the next class. So don't worry. We're here for another five minutes. We will take a more questions. You'll get out plenty of time. Yep. Matt? Yeah. Yeah. Did any of the bears that you relocated Yeah. Good question. So crazy enough, um, we didn't have a lot of collars, but we had maybe 25 collars. Within three days, a large male swam across the Yukon, swam across the Cuscoquim, and came right back. So yeah, they come back. They want to come home. Yeah. Were you ever afraid of just the lake and like going to end up in the Alvin, the new study? Were you ever afraid of the natural cycle? Because if you have that whole kind of thing, I heard. Yeah. Were you ever afraid of there being like a huge population of moose not in the Yep. As an ecologist, you know, you always think of those things. The situation in, in Alaska, especially where we were, um, it's, they consider it to be a predator pit. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that, but oftentimes when there's so many predators and such an intensity of predation on one species in particular, they can never recover unless some management is taken um, or unless we bring in caribou to have an alternative prey. Um, they're constantly going to get hit and never have a chance. Or unless a fire happens and the bear relocate, and we actually have had many fires up in that area since then, lightning strikes. Yep, back. Are there uh, similar problems in areas of Alaska where they have a uh, caribou population with no moose population? Uh, with no moose? Yeah. Caribou with no moose? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I think they're pretty, except in areas like where we are, where there's a ton of musket, I think you usually find both, or at least within the area. Uh, the caribou are often on a little bit higher elevation, um, and so even in the, in the cities, Anchorage and whatnot, there are quite a few mountains in that area where there are some small populations of caribou. I have a question. Um, so, you know, we're talking about the bears, how we were worried that the wolves might change their behavior because now there's a flood did you see a shift in the wolf here, or did they seem constant even though it was very Seems constant, yeah. They had some collars on the wolves as well. Thank you all for your attention and your um, questions.